218.35 miles an hour in the trials. Hi, honey. You been up long? Uh, a little bit. You had your breakfast? Yeah. Well, me now. Good. Police have identified the victim as Alejandro Rivera, a Peruvian sailor whose ship docked in Seattle early yesterday morning. Rivera was Aren't you supposed to be working on your report for world cultures? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is not yeah. Yeah. yeah, turn it off. Who says he'd never Thank you. So, nice look, Mom. Oh, don't even start. I have a video <laughs> conference later today. They can only see this. Everyone keeps in touch by email, but some people have never actually met their closest confidant in person. Today, partners in cyberspace meet face to face for the very first time. Will their relationship survive human contact? We'll talk about it on today's Open. Next. Good morning. It's November 14th, 2004. Welcome back to CBS This Morning. I'm Harry Smith. Good morning. I'm Paula Zahn. This morning, the latest on the transition at the White House. We're going to be taking a close look at the president-elect's plans for the nation and learn why she says it is time for a change. We'll also let you check out two hot new movies and Mark McEwen's going to show us if it's going to be hot anywhere today. Good morning. Sorry, Harry. Bad news. Not a pretty picture. I'll be back with the whole sad story for you in just a few minutes. Or click those buttons right now for my national forecast. Or a look at your local web. When is this project due, actually? Uh, tomorrow, fifth period. Jackson. I know, I know. But I work best under pressure. You know, if you just learned to plan your time a little bit better, you wouldn't have to do everything at, at the, the last, last minute. minute. I know. This morning's choices for you on CBS This Morning. An in-depth look at the incoming administration. Is the first husband in line for a cabinet? Seriously, post? Jackson. Are you going to be able I'll to get this done? Yes. On time? Continues. Yes. John Stair takes you to a restaurant that is actually cheaper than eating at home. Can just need some more. Something real that the other kids can actually touch. I'm just dead. Or the interactive hit, Jurassic Park 6.1. For years now, you've heard me talk about ways to save money by doing things yourself. But when it comes to lunch in Gates Sweet. Center, Kansas, you're much better off leaving it to Franny. Everyone wonders how she does it. Yeah, I like that. Cool. Stocks up when she gets a good price. She buys big quantities. I'm, I need a Mom, I really need this thing for my project. I think it'll make it a lot better. Mm -hmm. What do you want? I need you to drive me down to Pioneer Square today. Please? Okay, 3 o'clock. Not 3.15, 3 o'clock, okay? Yeah. Misto, skinny half and half. Thank you. And a macchiato, double full straight. Thank you, you're done. That's perfect. Oh no, allow me, you got the last one. Yeah, that's right, I forget that. I don't know. There we go. That's Laz, he wants to know why we're late. <laughs> He'll survive. <laughs> my coffee. No kidding, man. A coffee before work. Ah, coffee. Oh, don't mind if I do. So good of you two to join us. 
There was a line. Hey, McGowan. Yeah? Old lady tall. Yeah? I thought you were cutting back. I am. It's half and half. I'll never get used to this time. Anyway, let's get going. Merchant Marine got whacked last night down at the docks. Victim's name, Alejandro Rivera. Peruvian passport. No apparent motive. He obviously annoyed somebody. Yeah, that'll be all for now. We'll check it out. I'll call it up here on the map here. Ugh. And there wasn't anything unusual besides the dead body. Thanks a lot. You've been really Nice place. A little short on deck chairs. Yeah, and the pool needs cleaning. <laughs> hey, it's Laz. DEA is a dead end. The FBI came through, though. It wasn't drugs our friend Rivera was smuggling. Bingo. May I help you? Oh, hi. Uh, Becca McGowan, uh, Stu Ryan, Seattle PD. Uh, you're the owner? Yes. We understand your store sells pre-Columbian art? Yes. Reproduction. Well, we're uh, working on a case that involves pre-Columbian art, and we need to get a little background. Quite frankly, we're out of our depth. And, and you thought you'd pick my brain. Yes. Well, then, I guess you better come in. Thank you. We'll go up to my office. I'll just step this very far back. It's a beautiful store. Thank you. How valuable are these things? Everything I sell is a reproduction. Some of it's very expensive, but there's nothing that's valuable. You mind if I record this? Not at all. Okay. Now, uh, these uh, pre-Columbian pieces, Mr. Uh, Blackwood, uh, where are these made? Well, most of mine are made in Peru. In Peru? Various suppliers. The workshops in Mexico are cheaper, but it shows. Now, what exactly are you investigating? Smuggling. Illegal importation of antiquities. I do believe you are first. Jackson. Mr. Ballard. I had a hardware problem. <laughs> okay, my report is on pre-Columbian art. We find this kind of art in Peru, where we study the Incas, right? There. I have brought a replica of some of the yard. Well, let's just start it. I hope you have as much fun watching it as I had putting it together. So, here we go. Most of what we know about this culture, we know about them from their art. So, this was an incredibly sophisticated civilization. And then one day, they just disappeared. Nobody really knows what happened. I mean, maybe they got hit by the plague. Or maybe the ink is dusted. But they're gone. It kind of made me wonder where our civilization will be in a couple hundred years. That's it. There 
very well done. So good. Thank you. Thank you. One of the key propositions in the book is that this will be a more evolutionary process than many people have suggested. Uh, that is, the PC will continue to get better. The Internet will have more and more cool content on it. People will be connecting up at higher speeds through ISDN and, and PC cable modems. And so those are here and now things that companies are going after and there's a real business case for them. The ultimate where you connect up all the video devices or as we say information appliances in the book uh, will take quite some time. I still believe that within a decade pretty much that ultimate vision will be available to a lot of people around the world. I think if I'd known how much time it would take to write a book, I might not uh, have done a book. I did think it was a, a great time to share some thoughts on the potential of the technology and take some of the themes that come up again and again as I talk about the topic, the, the fears that people have, the, the dreams that people have, and share those to widen the debate and really um, make my uh, uh, contribution to the, what should be a a very broad discussion uh, about the future. Well, the Internet is evolving at quite an incredible pace. And it's, it's really fantastic because any weakness you can come up with in the Internet, uh, you can say there's dozens of companies that have been started up to try and get rid of that weakness and, and uh, turn it into a strength. And so the Internet is at critical mass. It's a phenomenon like the original IBM PC that grew to be a, a very, very central standard. So the, the eventual highway will evolve out of the Internet. So depending on how you're using your, your terminology, you can say that the Internet will become the highway. Now, there'll be some very qualitative changes between now and then. The variety of devices that are hooked up, the kind of material that are out there in terms of audio and video, the breadth of material, the ease of interfacing with it, the idea of agents helping to find things, the idea of user customizability, uh, the idea of security and directories and transactions, all of those things will have to come into play. So the, the highway and the Internet are, are tied up together, and uh, the Internet is, is a key reason why the highway will happen. But it, it won't look like what we have today when it, it all comes together. I really envy kids who are growing up today because of this accessibility to information in an engaging form. Uh, simply paging through the encyclopedia like I did, it, it's so scattered, the information about one particular branch of science or what happened in the 16th century or a, a country and what makes it unique. They're all just mixed together. And so it makes it hard to kind of get your mind around it. And uh, it's a very rare uh, person who, who wants to slog through and, and learn things in an alphabetical sequence. Well, in addition to that, now you've got the pictures, you've got the sounds, you've got the links that you can explore, and the ability to test your knowledge to say, you know, what, what level of skill do you have understanding some branch of science or history or any topic that you want to explore. Every student will have more opportunity than the most privileged student had just a decade ago. Well, in many areas, there's going to have to be a lot of experimentation 
before we figure out how to take full advantage of what the highway offers. And the classroom is a, a fantastic example of that. Clearly with the highway you can have uh, teachers who specialize in bringing a subject to life, sharing their ideas about how to make a subject engaging uh, with all the other teachers and students throughout the world. The idea of having all the students come together in a group will still be very important for group problem solving, uh, for them to hear things that uh, other students came up with or things that other students were confused about. But there may also be parts where you can go off and explore the uh, learning material individually or in very small groups, say two or three kids uh, all in front of a screen navigating together and deciding uh, where they want to take that that learning experience. Being able to track what kids do uh, as they're navigating and have the teacher be aware of that. How far did they get? You know, what questions were they able to answer well? What other topics did they go off into? Where did they kind of pause? And so we need to get the equipment into the schools. We need to get the training into the schools. We need to uh, have incentives for building this rich interactive material that can compete with the uh, TV quality things that all these kids are so used to uh, and yet uh, uh, be used for learning purposes. Now this electronic world that we talk about really can only achieve its potential if almost everyone's participating. The whole way that different countries will go about making sure this is easily available, uh, you'll see some variation. Certainly I expect that, that schools will have these tools easily available, that libraries, uh, and that anywhere today that you find a, a paid telephone or a cash machine, uh, that there will be a more general purpose device that has a screen and lets you tap into this, this whole world not only to get messages, but to make reservations, to get information, to see what the latest news is, and that it will be very inexpensive for people to connect up. Advances like the newspaper didn't have to be subsidized because through advertising the price became very, very low. Whereas a few other things like the telephone, many countries did go to some kind of rate subsidization ac across the population. It's not really known uh, in, in this case, how much advertising can do. I do feel very optimistic, though, that, that physical access uh, to the, the machines, the terminals that will connect you up, up to this will be broadly available uh, without much cost. I think Probably the most difficult thing to predict about the uh, electronic world is how it will affect socialization. And this is not uh, an area that, that people change very rapidly. And yet the idea of being able to get so much information about the neat things going on in town and how you can get there, when it's scheduled, what your friends thought about it, you know, see the menu before you go to the restaurant, that information access part, I think, will be a great success. The bigger question, though, is whether you'll really make friends this way, whether somebody who's elderly, can't get out as much, uh, can share their video with other people playing games, go into to forums where you have common interests and talk about uh, what should be done. And The possibilities for socialization will be vast, and it may be that it's really the young generation growing up with these tools right now uh, that will take this to its fullest potential and that my generation or people older uh, will always hold back and, and think of it primarily as, a, as an information tool. The computer is moving into the home more and more, uh, both for parents who want to bring work back with them or even spend part of the workday at home telecommuting or have a side business that they run out of their home. Uh, and also the, the kids are really getting involved, often being the ones who understand the machine the best and, and teach their parents what 
the possibilities are. But I don't think home automation will be a real driving force for the computer in the home. Some people will try it and eventually it'll get inexpensive and reliable, but it won't be out there on the leading edge. Uh, far more typical will be the uh, ability to reach out and communicate. Say you've got kids at, at college and you want to stay in touch with them. Well, electronic mail is a, is a great way to do that. And so the PC will be in a very high percentage of homes over the next five years. You get to select who can ring your phone. You get to select who can put mail into your mailbox. Because the scarce resource is your time, your desire uh, to not be interrupted. So I do expect great mechanisms will emerge in the electronic world that will allow us to be very explicit about privacy and yet let the people who need to get to us um, um, get access. There is a, a very difficult issue about material that's out on the network that you want to control your children's access to. One aspect that we need to get into this world is that you identify yourself uh, properly to the network so you can't pretend to be someone else. Uh, and part of identifying yourself is indicating how old you are. And once you can rely on that information, then the material can be keyed according to what's appropriate. In fact, a parent could even put in to the uh, user description for their children what sort of policies they've decided to adopt. And there probably will be rules over time that force publishers to properly identify their material uh, so that it can be categorized. There's an open question of whether it'll be a more voluntary approach or whether it'll be an imposed approach uh, with laws to really back that up. Well, coming up with a, a simple explanation for the kind of success that uh, I, I've been privileged to be part of working at Microsoft is very difficult. Certainly there's, there's many elements to it. Uh, the vision of the company uh, coming right when the microprocessor was coming into its own, the focus on software and working with partners who could bring in the other elements, uh, the focus on the long term, hiring great people, uh, really working with customers, knowing that you know, we'd be there working with them 10 years later and 20 years later. Uh, all of those have come together um, to, to build uh, a great success story that's been incredibly fun to be part of. I think you know, the, the people is probably the thing I'd put at the top. Um, uh, vision has got to be a, a big part of it. Uh, but so many of these things, you know, really come down to day-to-day -to -day execution. If we'd slacked off at any point, uh, then, you know, there would have been plenty of people to come in and, and take our place. And that's certainly the case as we look forward, that you know, we have to continue to obsolete the products, continue to stay in close touch with the customers, continue to hire in great people and stay on top of the technology, or else the phenomena will continue, but we won't have uh, the role in it that we, that we have today. Well, the thing that, that really gets me energized is how much fun it is to come in every day and work with smart people on very tough but important problems. So I'm having uh, uh, a lot of fun. I, I think my job is probably the best job in the world as we go down this path and you know month by month make progress and uh, figure out what what contribution uh, we can make. I think it's safe to say I'm about you know halfway through my career uh, because I I can't imagine uh, you know being over 60 and and still being on top of it. Maybe when I get to be 60 I'll I'll change my mind and have a different view of it but uh, uh, I, I see my future as continuing to play the same role 
uh, at Microsoft that I have and, and just bringing a lot of focus and energy to that, that job. I dropped out of Harvard because I had a vision that there could be a computer on every desk and in every home. And Microsoft has relentlessly pursued that vision. A lot of what this is about is about thinking of the PC not as a standalone productivity tool, but as a communications tool. Uh, so that wherever you are in business, if you want to find a product, you want to find a consultant, it's easy to reach out, uh, not only to find, but also to do the work there. So things like working at a dis distance across national boundaries, working at home, uh, finding the best product, getting recommendations on it, all of those things will be very, very simple. And they'll save people lots of times and enable us to do new things. And that promise carried out in business, uh, in the home and in education, uh, perhaps most importantly, is what makes us so uh, enthused about this information highway. A major milestone uh, for us was when we were walking through Harvard Square one time and saw this popular electronics magazine. And it was kind of, in a way, you know, good news, bad news. Here was someone making a computer around this chip in exactly the way that uh, Paul had talked to me and you know, we thought about what kind of software could be done for it. And it was happening without us. You know, in a few years, uh, everyone was going to be wired into a multimedia uh, network that's going to be connected either to their personal computers uh, or their television sets. So they'll be, they'll be able to interact with uh, uh, all the information uh, basically in the world uh, in an online fashion, interactive fashion. Microsoft, electronic mail is central to how we work. Whenever I leave to go on a trip, I download into my little portable computer all the messages that people have sent me, and then as I'm on the plane, I can respond to those and read those. And so as soon as I get anywhere, I just plug into a phone line and it goes back. I get the newest messages and the ones I've typed in or sent. Anyway, electronic mail is a great thing, and it sort of a, gives people a glimpse of what's to come in this highway. I have experience that uh, with particular vigor as my electronic mail address has been published in places like the New Yorker and Fortune magazine and other places. Uh, and it's amazing the electronic mail you get from people around the world. It's actually kind of fun. And, and the software can sort it out so that my high priority mail goes one place and my low priority mail goes another place. But I, I do eventually get around to seeing all that, particularly if it relates to our products. It's uh, something that I, I make sure we respond to. This is a, a revolution in communications that is just as significant, many historians and thinkers believe, as the invention of the printing press. Cryptography will become a very key technology, no pun intended, to, uh, to control the use of, inter of intellectual property. 
As wonderful as the world of computers is today, it's a world where you can't prove who you are, you can't sign your name, and in most cases, you can't keep people out. The real world's not like that. And as we take our products out into the real world and start supplanting systems like cash, like uh, credit cards, we start putting our personal information online, we'll need the sufficient technology to make sure that's safe and easy. Well, when I went to Lakeside School, I was about uh, 12 years old, started there in, in seventh grade. Uh, that was kind of a, a change for me. It's private boys' school, uh, very strict. And you know, at first, I didn't really like the environment. I did eventually find some friends there, some of whom had the same sort of interest in you know, reading business magazines and fortune. And we were always. Uh, creating funny company names and having people send us their product literature and uh, trying to, to, to think about how business worked and, and in particular looking at computer companies and what was going on with them. Microsoft was founded based on my vision of a personal computer on every desk and in every home. We have never wavered from that vision. Microsoft, a name and reputation known around the world. Based in Redmond, Washington, Microsoft employs thousands of people worldwide. The company operates on a vision of a computer on every desk in every home running Microsoft software. Microsoft designs, develops, markets, and supports a wide range of computer operating systems, applications, development tools and languages, hardware peripherals, and books. Microsoft products are designed to make it easy to take advantage of the power of personal computing and help people do what they want to do better, smarter, and faster. Microsoft believes meeting the needs of its customers requires total commitment to connecting people with information at the touch of a finger. This is a, a revolution in communications that is just as significant, many historians and thinkers believe, as the invention of the printing press. I really believe that it's, it's the rest of this decade before the kind of uh, vision that so many in, of the people in the industry have talked about is realizable. Uh, our shorthand for that vision is information at your fingertips. And what it means is that you can get information easily. You don't have to think what kind it is. It's all integrated together. Uh, and in this information age, the PC, together with great software, really becomes the fundamental tool to let you be innovative, to let you see what's going on, to let you work with other people. And I think that this represents an incredible opportunity for all of us. Trafo data was uh, uh, taking road volume data and converting it into reports where you have just a, actually a 16 channel paper tape on the side of the road that that pressure sensitive hose that you drive over there's a counter in there that's clicking out a count every 5, 10 or 15 minutes and those have to be processed for 
the uh, state road departments to give out money for repairs and decide how to do traffic lights. Anyway, it's data that needed to be processed. So we got involved in, in that. We were truly naive in that we built a machine using the very first uh, decent microprocessor, the 8008. This Altair is actually a running Altair. And what we've done is we've loaded the basic into its memory. So this has an 8080 chip in it and uh, 16K of memory. Yeah, this basic was the first um, real piece of software ever written for a, a PC. And it, it became, for the first generation of PCs, the thing that unlocked the power that was there. Because although some people did machine language programming, 90% of what got done was done in, in uh, basic. And 90% and of that was Microsoft basic, the descendants of this tape that got onto all those early machines. When we started digital, I was the closest thing we had to a tool maker. Not a good one, but I made the original tools. Uh, we used cutting sheet metal and making parts. And uh, I can at least carry on a conversation with people today. I hired a friend of mine from college, Steve Ballmer, who was very good at hiring people. And so he could see that we, were, we had more projects that we wanted to do than we could. And he was able to almost double the size of the company and people every year for the next five years. Kazuhiko Nishi, who is a very close friend of mine from Japan, really taught me about the Japanese market, got us doing the very first Japanese personal computer, the NEC PC 8000, and many of those other projects. He's a yeah, he's a visionary, very energetic, almost overly uh, optimistic about where things can go. Uh, and it started a lot of the early computer magazines in Japan and, and worked with us for a long time. Education is an exciting area because as we improve education, we see the downstream benefit in every other area. Students collaborating with each other, teachers who do good work, 
putting it out on the network and sharing it. And companies can come along and give awards and visibility to teachers who have put out the best stuff that gets picked up by other people.